and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of quite a few RPGs on his itch.io page. And more relevant to this, the creator of the of Overwar, the Night Comes Down, now coming coming into Kickstarter through its Monarch edition. The one, the one and only, oh, Richard Kelly. How are you doing today, man? Doing all right. How are you? I am doing good. I wish the weather was a little bit colder, but I'm doing good. Yep, that is that is always the goal. A little bit colder weather, a little bit more of an arctic climate. Everybody says I'm crazy for wanting the weather cold, and I'm, and I'm like, get, if it gets colder, you can just put another layer on. Exactly. Winter is the good season. Every other season, kind of play it by ear. That, and when there's enough snow on the ground, um, some people look at it look at that as snow and look at it as a hindrance. I look at it and say, hey, free ammo. True enough. Especially, especially since I've there was an infamous stunt that I that I did a long time ago where I got I got some lunch trays from a nearby school, filled them with snow, and laid them out around around my roommate's bed. Uh did your roommate wake up before they melted? No. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I can see the uh, the infamous part of that stunt then. You know, so he st he steps out of bed, and the first thing he steps in is snow. Yup, yup. Uh -huh. Definitely, uh, definitely an exciting way to wake up. Was he? He had said that there was no way that I could that I could prank that I could prank him while he while he was asleep. Oh well, in that case, this is entirely his fault. Yes, especially especially since. I guess his I guess his idea was he he thought I'd do something like the shaving cream st um, stunt, which I've done that. Everybody's done that. That's boring. Yeah. If you're gonna, if you're gonna get at somebody, go the extra mile. Now, granted, yeah, I, or granted, my version the of the extra. extra lunch granted, my extra mile is a little is a little bit extreme because that because that includes things like. Um, Putting a program in someone's computer so that the so that the CD tray opens every ninety seconds. A classic. No, nothing doesn't do anything malicious. It's just there to trigger their OCD. Uh, yes, the the CD. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you could just leave it out there, but it's just going to be sitting there taunting you. Yep. Uh, the. Or, we are we are way off topic. Yeah, <laughs> but get, getting back on the getting back on the rails, because oh. this is a chaotic kind of show. This is a chaotic kind of show. Oh, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh gosh. Uh, okay, so. The year is, like, 2002. I'm at a family barbecue. My cousins bring me a copy of D&D 3.0. Um, and up until that point, the only thing I'd heard about D&D &D was this is the thing that hypnotizes you and makes you kill people. Because my parents had gotten, like, a weird holdover from the satanic panic, uh, mm -hmm. the anti-D&D propaganda. Um... So I, I went in with some like some preconceptions, like maybe this is dangerous, maybe I should be careful about it, and those preconceptions lasted like literally one game. Just immediately hooked. Mm -hmm. And then didn't know that there were any other RPGs other than D and D until like two thousand and nine, uh, when I spent a year in Japan and played some stuff there. Mm-hmm. And so I'd only played D and D uh, up to that point, and then my second RPG was Golden Sky Stories, uh, which, if you're familiar with, is super different from like 
Oh, I'm I'm Plastic no third edition. Yeah, I'm no games. stranger. I'm no stranger. This is this is as far removed from a D and D channel as one as one can get. <laughs> yep, great. Uh, so that like that jump from diceless uh, uh, D twenty crunchy uh, procedural simulationy to completely gamey diceless point based cozy. I uh, sort of broke my brain uh, and got me super interested in the design of RPGs. And so I didn't do anything with that uh, for another uh, 10 or so years. But eventually in like 2015, 2016, I started attempting to write and design tabletop stuff. And at that point, I figured if I was going to do tabletop design... I need to do a lot of it so that I can get kind of good at it. Yeah. And that's what the uh, past uh, eight or so years have been. Now, whenever I whenever I have somebody on and talk about the chain of events that led to a certain point, I usually try and um, establish a timeline. Though, obviously, in th in this kind of situation, it's a little bit harder to do. It's a little bit harder to do that because. It is alt. It's alt because obviously there's no um, there's no way to do that with how itch has things set up, and oh <laughs> yep, um, of, and of course there's the sheer amount of content. Yes, so I could, I do keep a um, a a log of uh, everything I've published. Mm -hmm. So I could pull open that Google Doc and take you chronologically through everything I've published, but uh, it's it's a fair few pages long. Um, if we did, if we went through that whole doc, we'd probably be here all night. Yeah, uh, yeah, of just me reading titles in a monotone. So mm -hmm. it's probably better if we don't do that. But if yeah. there were specific games or styles of design or stuff well, like I, that, I you to ask about. I suppose I'll start with what was the first, um, first full-on, full-length um, project, not a expansion to something that was that was already that was already done. What was the what was the first wholly yours kind of TTRPG? Okay, so the first self-published standalone thing I did was the Dawn Line. Um, it's a sort of Vampire Hunter D influenced sci-fi western with vampires mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that it's on a planet with a very weird orbital period and so the day takes up most of the planet and the night takes up most of the planet and they move very slowly slow enough that if you were to walk you could kind of outpace the twilight mm -hmm. and so that's what the vampires on that planet do they walk in the very thin band in between the moving day and the moving night uh, where it is safe for them to be uh, because if they go too far into the night, the planet's native inhabitants will eat them and if they fall too far into the dawn, they will evaporate. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, can, and I can see that. That's like a big 200 page core book with a couple of supplements and very high quality art and absolutely amazing layout um, from Void Spiral. Um, it it looks beautiful. It's like a conventional standard RPG book. And after producing that, I realized, oh, these are these are difficult to finance. I need to change my scope. So my next string of projects were all sort of um, public domain art. Uh, using whatever assets I could find, learning layout myself, um, and keeping the scope much more tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, and of, co of course, there were, there were some concepts I saw, in I saw in there where I could see where, th where things were going, and then there were some, there were some where, uh, where, I'm go where I'm going, where, where, where did this idea came from? And one of the big ones is the flexor cysts. Ah, okay. Um, so, for maybe like a quarter of my games, uh, I start with a title. 
and flexor cysts is one of those. Uh, I just kind of smushed the word together and then tried to build out the setting from that word. So, like, yeah, of course it's about, like, uh, masked wrestlers and exorcisms. Mm -hmm. that's, that's clearly how those two words fit together. Um, and it, it helps that it's a smaller game, so I didn't have to write 100 pages of lore like I did with something like Donline. Uh, I could just kind of give people the premise and keep the mechanics simple. Mm -hmm. I could... um, I, I'll also say that for stuff like the Flexorsis, I like a little bit of absurdism when I'm designing things, so... When I can, I try to include some sort of element of the ridiculous in in my games, as long as it doesn't uh, completely torpedo their tone. And given given what I've seen in Lucha Libre movies, um, re a wrestling exorcist is, relatively speaking, tame. Yep. Yeah, the... The inspiration for Flexorcists was kind of pulled from, like, um, El Santo mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, in, in the El Santo comics, he's, like, he's fighting Dracula and uh, the Wolfman and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, good... Lucha Libre movies and, co and comics are a good, are a good, um, r are a good rabbit hole to go down to if, you, if anyone wants to see just how ridiculous that kind of thing can get. Um, yep. I'd, I'd say this, the same would apply for some for for some of the giallo films over over in Italy. Uh, just yes. How, just how, I don't want I don't want to say that some that some that some creators were do, were doing lines, but it was the seventies. Yeah, not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think to juxtapose Jallo and uh, Lucha Libre, but they are both kind of pulp scenes. Both um, kind of pulp scene. Both flirt with both flirt with horror in one form or another, or flirt with yep. Um, um, the, well, in the case of in the case of Jallo, Jallo was the equivalent of pulp when it when it was just, when it was just Italian translations of mystery novels. Um, the word comes from the comes from the fact that a lot of those books had yellow covers. Yeah. Uh, eventually, that moved into film and get and could get could get weird. Is the best way to put it. Yeah, definitely, definitely, extremely expressive. Yeah. Now, with over with Overwar, um, yep. you've stated. <laughs> That's you stated that some of the inspirations were um, the works of Yasumi Matsuno. Uh, yes. And I'm... So Overwar, mm -hmm. the thing that I'm kickstarting currently mm -hmm. with uh, with Alex from Black Oath mm -hmm. um, is inspired by Yasumi Matsuno, and so stuff that uh, stuff that people might be familiar with that he's done. Um, Final Fantasy Twelve. Tactics Ogre, mm -hmm. Ogre Battle, Vagrant Story, um, a lot of like very very classic uh, tactics RPGs. Mm -hmm. And then of of all the stuff you put in there, and then there's Igdra Union, which is part of the Department Heaven series, which is yes. The, there's a lot of things that could be said about Department Heaven, but boring is not one of them. Yep. In fact, the whole per the whole point of that series was to make a game series where each game was so vastly different from each other, even if it was in the same relative genre. Yeah, uh, relative genre is definitely the descriptor I would use. Um, they they're all kind of RPGs, but there are there are huge mechanical gulfs I mean, in what they do. Yggdra Union and Knights in the Nightmare are both tactics games, and that's the only thing they have in common. Yep. Yep. And I, I know yeah, I, Knights in the Nightmare was ported to um, P PSP and then later to PC. I have a hard time um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that, because so much of 
what I originally played felt like it was built for the DS. Yeah, I I haven't cracked open Knights in the Nightmare yet. I did luck into a copy of it, mm-hmm. um, so I can. It's just a matter of scheduling time to play games, which is harder than you would expect as a designer. Oh, I I can I can relate. Uh, and of course. Although, give, although given that, I I have to express a small bit of disappointment because I'm seeing a significant lack of Queen references. <laughs> so, uh, that's a that's a good call out. Um, Ogre Battle, uh, which is one of Yasumi Matsuno's earlier works, uh, for mm-hmm. for the benefit of the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, subtitled "March of the Black Queen" is a reference to a song by the band Queen. Um, not for any like thematic reason. Just uh, he's just a fan it. of Qu- he's just a fan of Queen, and he keeps sneaking in Queen references in his work. Because Ogre Battle is enough is another song by Queen. Obviously, March of the Black yep. Queen, and the follow up um, Tactics Ogre had the subtitle "Let Us Cling Together," which is a nod to the song "Teo Toriante," and I'm, I'm yep. butchering the pronunciation, but that it basically translated to "Let Us Cling Together." It's just that the Teo there is an outdated version of Jap- of uh, what is now Teo Wo, uh, and e- even even his work in Twelve, he managed to sneak one in with one of the Espers having a spell called Rock You. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> so, Didn't know about that. Though, one. I have to I have to put Twelve in a special category because he started the concept, but he didn't finish it. He had to bow yep. out midway through because of really bad health reasons. Yeah, he's not the sole writer on mm-hmm. Twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so to to circle back to the Queen thing, yeah, um, there is a song off of the 1973 album Queen called "The Night Comes Down." Mm-hmm. Uh, so the original edition of Overwar is Overwar the Night Comes Down. Uh, this Monarch edition has a bunch of extras, but contains all the content from that original. Mm-hmm. And so the the spirit is carried forward. Calling it calling it Monarch edition is a is a could be construed as a bit of a callback since the one Ogre Battle that Matsuno didn't do was Ogre Battle sixty four, which had the subtitle person of lordly person caliber. of lordly caliber yes mm-hmm. uh monarch edition was not intended as a callback to either the word queen itself or person of lordly caliber but um i i do like that that link exists mm-hmm. uh, we just we needed something to make it clear that this is not just the original content it's got new stuff as well yeah now the that's obvious. That's there's obviously a lot of directions that that can be um, ta- that can be taken with this approach. But from what I've seen, vis- and maybe maybe that maybe this is apropos or not. What I'm seeing visually, um, the set the setting that you have of the the world of Balark leans far more into Ogre Battle and, t- and Tactics Ogre and a little bit of pro- of Vagrant Story in terms of this um this got this gothic medieval fantasy yep i i really liked the nuanced conflict in ogre battle march of the black queen the like the game does a very good job of sort of slowly presenting to you the idea that any military conflict is really really complicated um and introducing the idea that like not everyone who's on the other side is your enemy not everybody who's your friend is a good person and those are sort of like themes across matsuno's work in general um Mm -hmm. but the the structure of uh march of the black queen does a very good job in slowly presenting this information to the player and kind of chipping away at the player's sense of conviction um and that's something i really like thematically in a game about war and so i was trying to to pull those influences specifically Mm -hmm. Um, the setting of balark is big and complex it's a federation of provinces and administrative territories and kingdoms and whatnot 
Um, not all of them get along, but they've all recently been conquered by invaders from the clouds, so any attempt at a reconquest is going to have to navigate not just the recent trauma of those provinces having been conquered by the invaders, but also all of the history of those provinces. Mm -hmm. Now, one per with a lot of with a lot of the games in that particular tactics RPG approach, you end up having a lot of even if the story is centered on a few characters, you end up having a lot of controllable characters. So yes, in some in something like Overwar, how do you carry how do you carry that same idea of you're commanding an army while not bogging the game down in a bunch of um, stat blocks? So uh, basically, we have two easy steps. Uh, the first is to mostly remove dice. Um, dice are a thing you can invoke as the player in some situations. Um, like if you want to make a roll on a skill, or sometimes if a special ability activates, you might roll a die. But for the bulk of combat, you don't roll dice at all. Attacks just hit. Um, and the only way that works is there is a tremendously large pool of recruitable characters in the game. And when you make your player character, you create one character to be your commander. And then you have a bunch of slots that you can drop other recruitable characters into. So you end up fighting as a small formation of units, usually like five or six guys. Um, and uh, every, every character gets a single action. Uh, characters act in order from front to back, left to right. And there's generally no dice rolls, so those, uh, those actions happen quickly. Um, and this means that the uh, formation that you build has a huge impact on whether or not you win combats. Mm -hmm. Now you, uh, you so, oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, so basically, you kind of you pack your unit with characters that you want to include, and those characters are both a, a mechanical part of fights, but also like characters that you can play as. Um, you can switch from role-playing as your commander to playing any of the characters in that unit, uh, especially during downtime between missions, when it's sort of incentivized for you to spend some time as the other characters. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, unless, I'm mis unless I'm mistaken, you... When it comes to, when it comes to who, you're, who you're fielding for a, for a given encounter, that's where the draft system comes in. Am I correct on that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the, the draft system that you're alluding to is basically the number of points that you have to put other characters in your unit. Mm -hmm. um, you unlock different types of characters. Different characters have different draft point costs. And as long as you have a character type unlocked, um, whenever you're in a place of relative safety, you can shuffle around which characters are currently deployed in your unit. Um, so you can sort of adapt your formation to upcoming encounters. Uh, you can try out different strategies. It's it's flexible. You're not locked into just one set of characters. Yeah. And when it though you do have you do have a dividing line between basic characters and advanced characters. Yes, what? that's new. Mm -hmm. Um Originally, all all characters were just kind of uh, sorted by point cost, and that's it. For Monarch Edition, one of the things I did to try and make it a bit user friendlier was to take the characters with comparatively simple and easy to understand gimmicks and front load them all in their own section, and then take the characters that do convoluted nonsense and put them in their own section. Which definitely makes sense. Now, given that there's qu there's quite a variety of char of characters at all at all three, um, t all three tiers, uh, I'm get I'm guessing that no that no matter how far this this version goes, uh, the draft the draft point cost is not going to exceed three. Um. So there are four point characters. 
Uh, yeah, I generally, it's always it. you yeah, you start with five draft points, mm -hmm. um, and most of what you can select at the start is one, two, or three point characters. Four point characters are basically sort of the the legends of the game. Um, they're very good and very unique, but in addition to costing so much, they also come with a unique condition uh, mm. where you have to keep them appeased or they will permanently leave. Mm -hmm. And those conditions can be things like uh, if you ever retreat, this this legendary character will leave. Or if your reputation uh, dips too low, this character will leave. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, with I also no, I also noticed that in that you you do have a you do have a bit of hex navigation, um, but you also yep. have hexes in combat, and I, that's certainly a unique move. There are more games that use square that that when they do grid combat they use squares instead of hexes. What made you want to go with the hex approach? Is it just to unify the bigger map with the combat map? Uh, let me take a quick look at that. Um, the because I I don't think there are necessarily there aren't necessarily hexes that are counted in combat itself. Uh, the way it typically works is you navigate around the hex map that mm -hmm. is like the province that you're currently trying to liberate, mm -hmm. and if you bump into an enemy unit, um then you enter combat. And combat happens off to the side of the map. Uh, it's not on hexes. Um, each unit has a front row and a back row with usually up to six characters in each. Um, and the characters act in order. Um, where a character is located matters a little bit. Uh, attacks have different kinds of targeting. So some uh, something like an archer will target an enemy in the back row. Um, and so it can matter where you put your characters in your unit. Mm -hmm. But um, in, within combat, you're not like... You're not moving around a map. Uh, you're not dealing with hexes. Um, the combat is a simulation that happens uh, apart from the main strategy board. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, unless there is something in the text that is confusing, yeah. it's I, it's entirely possible that I think there it, is I think a it was the language that hasn't been. I think it was the integrated the way the um the way hexes and combat were mentioned in the same paragraph that threw me off. Um, ah, okay. But I'll take another look over at that because I I might be able to polish the language there and make it a little bit less confusing. Um, mm hmm. But with that, with that said, since since you brought up the row system that you have, I am a bit, I am a bit curious how is how um I'm now I'm assuming when it comes to certain weapons the the um what the people you can target in front in front and or back row is is going to be important, but. Would would there be any changes if somebody was using, say, a great weapon, like like say a great sword, or or the like, or for or for another example, using a pole arm? Would that change who they're able, they're eligible to target? It's a good question. Um, the way this system handles characters, if you were to have a character that was, for example, using a pole arm instead of their usual weapon you'd make them as an entirely new type of character. Um, you don't equip items onto the characters in your unit. Uh, they just are like the character type that they are. So the archer is a guy with a bow. You can't stick a sword on him. He doesn't know how to use it. He's, he's an archer. That is his comfort zone. Um, there are different types of targeting that you could use to represent something like a halberd. Um, the targeting types are nearest, furthest, front row, back row, weakest, strongest, heal, leader, and all. So if you have a character that basically does a, a big 
uh, flourish and sweep on the front row with the halberd, mm -hmm. you could write him as like one physical damage front row. Right, and that. all of these targeting types have their own cost. There's um, there's rules for building individual character types that are pretty easy. Um, so you can, if you have a specific vision for a type of character you want to recruit, mm -hmm. you can create that character. And then there's a, a whole mechanic um, in downtime for creating and adding new types of characters to your army. Yeah, I I can get I can get that. And since you since you've brought up um, Final Fantasy Tactics, I'd like to play I'd like to play a little bit of word association, a, a really bad Rorschach test, if you will. Sure. So what I'm going what I'm going to do is I'm is I'm going to list off some of the central some of the central characters from ta from um, tactics and I'd like I'd like you to tell me which um, which char which character archetypes you think would be the closest the closest analog that you, that could be used obviously with obviously with a good chunk of these a one-to-one -one is not possible especially given the job system yeah uh, the the problem uh... <laughs> The place where this might initially fall apart is all of the characters in Final Fantasy Tactics are probably going to be better represented as commanders in this game. Uh, commanders are... they follow the same rules mm -hmm. as recruitable characters, but they're, they're all built custom, mm -hmm. um, and they all have their own unique traits. Um, all right, in, in that case, oh, I'll, I'll uh, shift it a little bit and... I'll name one of the I'll name one of the jobs and 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 have you oh, go with an go with yes. what would be an equip what would be a equivalent or a close analog. Yeah, um, the jobs I can probably match a bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, Squire. Oh gosh, uh, that's going to be the pawn. It's a basic uh, medium HP unit that attacks nearest for one physical damage. Mm -hmm. It is. Not very exciting, but it is good for soaking up damage and filling space. Knight. Uh, knight is going to be... Did I actually call it the knight? I did not call it the knight. I called it something else. Uh, or I put it somewhere that I was not expecting to look. Uh, there should be a simple... Um, physical tank character uh, I must have stuck in advanced uh, I'm not as used to using the monarch edition mm -hmm. layout let me flip over to two point advanced characters and see if it's hiding there mm -hmm. it is not uh, we are going to say that the knight is probably uh, somewhere in between wolfhound uh, which in, in this game is a dog uh, decent hit points, attack nearest two physical damage, um, and also uh, oh, uh, which is just a big, big wall of meat mm -hmm. uh, that you can put in your front row. I all right, um, archer. Uh, archer is simple. There is just an archer in this. Um, there's several other flavors of uh, mundane ranged attacker. For example, the rocketist. But uh, it's just easy to say that the archer is the archer. That's yep. uh, a medium HP, two physical damage ranged attacker. Monk. Uh, there's straight up just a monk in this. All right. Thief. Uh, thief. There isn't. Um, but there is a variety of characters that uh, benefit your combat in slightly idiosyncratic ways. Um, for example, if you take an Adept, they're not great in combat, but they provide extra skill points to your commander temporarily. Um, there's also uh, Dune Runners, which are very low hit points, very fragile. Um, but they resist physical, so if they were to take any physical damage, they would reduce it. Uh, 
Uh, for some attacks, this can make them completely immune. Um, uh, there's also, for example, goblin scamperers uh, who are extremely fragile, but their gimmick is that they target the weakest character on the enemy side, uh, allowing them to sort of exploit uh, enemy formations with vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, the thief in tactics is sort of a complex class uh, in that it has a range of things that it's decent at. Um, so it's hard to sort of miniaturize it into just one character type here. Yeah. Um, Geomancer. Ah, uh, heck. <laughs> That's uh, even more convoluted than the thief. I would say... Um, yeah, uh, probably the closest equivalent to the Geomancer, uh, which is a, a class that I don't particularly like. Um, some units uh, in this that have uh, sort of coin flip attacks, where if the coin flip goes in your favor, uh, they'll do something good, and if the coin flip does not go in your favor, they will target themselves or target your unit or explode or any number of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, that feels like it fits the character of the, the Geomancer. Um, let me see if I can find a good example of one of those. Yeah, here we go. So the Astrologist um, is a moderately fragile, high damage front row magic attacker with the unreliable trait. So there's a 3 in 6 chance that it acts as if it were on the other side. Um, so it might do 4 damage to the enemy front row, or it might do 4 damage to your front row. That is that is the Geomancer. Mm -hmm. oh. Dragoon, or in some translations, or in the original translation, Lancer. Yep. Uh, so that's going to be a high damage physical single attacker. Um, so one way of one way of representing the dragon would probably be the commando. Uh, it's got pretty high hit points. It attacks weakest. It does magic damage, which nothing can mitigate. Uh, so it's good at kind of just like dropping out of the air onto the enemy back row and taking someone out. Um, it also has the skirmisher property, which lets the unit that it's in ignore terrain. Um, Terrain uh, is part of the strategy layer. It affects the individual hexes on the map. Um, some types of terrain can be to your benefit, um, but a lot of terrain can also penalize what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So having a character that just straight up ignores terrain can let you, for example, move very quickly through forests. Um, mm -hmm. That feels like it kind of captures the spirit of the, the dragoon. Mm -hmm. um, samurai. Ah, uh, Samurai. Um, we do have a Kensei in this. And the Kensei's gimmick is that they have a strong single target physical attack and then they backlash and take damage after attacking. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a class that just breaks swords in half to gain buffs, so I don't think I can perfectly represent that one, but... Oh, ninja. Uh, ninja. Um, hmm. Uh, probably the uh, cultist is the closest equivalent. Um, it is a attack weakest. It deals magic damage, so it bypasses resistances. And it deals a moderate amount of magic damage, but it is fragile. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dancer. Huh. <laughs> uh, let me flip over to Advanced Characters, because it's going to have to be something from there. Um, yeah, so maybe something like the Bestower of Harmonization. 
Um, uh, Bestow of Harmonization is an advanced character, so it's its mechanics are a bit weird. Um, it's compassionate, so it always acts as if it's part of the enemy team. It has a heal all zero, and it has the resonance trait. So what it does is, on its turn, it heals the entire enemy squad for nothing, and then sets up the resonance status effect on them. Mm. And with resonance... Uh, the first time you get hit with it, you start resonating. Every other time you get hit with it, you take damage. And it's magic damage, so it goes straight through your, your vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a character that fights in sort of a, a, a weird and arguably ineffective way, but affects large areas um, and can, over time, sort of affect the battle in a, in a unique way. That's not quite the the uh, tactics dancer, but that might be as close as I can get with sort of a random pick. Mm -hmm. um, chemist. Ah, uh, the chemist. Uh, so I am going to choose to represent the chemist not as an actual character, but as the equipment section. Um, so there are resources you can get in this game. Uh, usually if you uh, visit certain spots on the map, uh, visit towns, uh, make certain uh, alliances with other characters, you can get consumable resources called provisions. And you can spend those uh, inside and outside of battles to restore hit points um, and cause other various effects. Mm -hmm. Um, there isn't a specific character that does this, it's just the player that chooses when to spend these provisions, but spamming items is very much the gimmick of the chemist. Yep. Um, white mage, or priest originally. Yep. Uh, white mage, there are a variety of healer type units in this. Um, let me see if I can find a good example. Uh, the Saintess is a three-point character that's relatively tanky and that heals the front row. Mm -hmm. oh. There's there's a variety of other yeah. healer-type characters in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are in the advanced section and do weird stuff in addition to their heals, but this is a nice, straightforward, uh, durable healer. Yep. Black Mage. Uh, Black Mage. So there is a wizard uh, that deals magic damage to the entire enemy unit. It's relatively fragile and it's relatively pricey. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also an Archmage, which is uh, more of the same. Uh, more expensive, even more damage. Uh -huh. um, because everything sort of happens immediately in in Overwar, there isn't the like a timing gimmick in tactics. So you don't have to worry about your own squad walking into a fireball that you called down on a tile 20 turns ago. Um, so in that sense, it's not really like the tactics wizard, but it, it does the same sort of blast casting approach. Mm-hmm. And... Next would be Mystic, which was originally known as Oracle, the yin-yang mage. Oh, heck, uh, I confused that in my head with the Geomancer, so I think my Geomancer <laughs> answer might not have made a lot of sense. Yeah. Geomancer been... was... The, is the ter is has always been the terrain caster. Oh, I do not think I used those if I could avoid them. Mm -hmm. The the yin yang one is the one that spams random targeting effects. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, I think. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a good fifteen years since I've played Tactics. I'm probably due for a refresher. And that was um, prob and that was probably before the. Um, that was, that was probably, oh yeah, that was probably the the re-release. 
Um, per- before, I have not... before War of the Lions, and you probably didn't use the item dupe glitch. I didn't know there was an item dupe glitch. Yeah, that... The, the item dupe glitch was a, was a thing in the PS1 version. That's been a thing for a while. It's been abused quite a bit. Um, oh, heck. I yeah. honestly didn't feel like I needed uh, I needed any help with that. As soon as I got some monsters, I left them in my inventory by mistake, and then they just started producing level 99 chocobos. So most of that game was pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Oh. The so uh, this ne- game does not have an item dupe glitch yeah. <laughs> or uh, obviously level ninety nine chocobo spawn. Yeah, ob- I think obviously not. Square would take issue. Next would be time mage. Okay, so the time mage does sort of have an equivalent. Um, I'm going to flip over to the advanced section and see if I can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the Time Mage's gimmick of applying buffs and debuffs isn't super common in this system. There are lots of debuffs that can be applied, um, but they typically orbit around uh, setting up damage or vulnerability. I don't do the the time mages, your turns are slow now, your turns are fast, uh, you're frozen in time sort of uh, bag of tricks. Uh, But if you want a character that is very good at supporting your squad, while also uh, having a little bit of uh, damage output, um, Overwar has the Umbrella Mage. Uh, They're a moderately durable uh two point cost um low magic damage attacker that also has the diffusion trait which means that all attacks during that combat that have all as the targeting type deal less damage Mm -hmm. so if if your opponent were to field a lot of like wizards and archmages which attack all for moderate amounts of damage you could put an umbrella mage or two in your unit and just completely nullify those attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and nullification is definitely what the uh, the time mage does. Yeah. Oh, no. You will not be using that this round. <laughs> yep. Or any round, mm-hmm. really. Um, Orator, which was originally called Mediator in the PS1 game. Yep. Uh, that is definitely the commander. Mm-hmm. Um... The commander comes with skills. Uh, They're the only character in the game that has skills they can roll. Uh, Rolls are optional. You basically, if you encounter a situation where you want to roll, you tell the GM that you'd like to roll, and the GM will tell you the consequences for doing so. Mm -hmm. Um, The commander is also the character who is responsible for recruitment. Um... They're also the character who uh, shuffles the unit, uh, the characters in the unit around. Um, yeah, as far as a conversation and recruitment character goes, it has to be the commander. Mm-hmm. Um, summoner. Hmm. Uh, that would be sort of a big blast caster. Let me see if there's anything that is quite equivalent yeah the the summoner's gimmick relies on timing in final fantasy tactics like their effects are very powerful but they're much slower than usual Mm -hmm. um and timing isn't really a thing in overwar whatever your frontmost, leftmost character is, uh, that is the character that acts first. So you don't have to worry about like your big effect taking a while to go off. You can just put it in the front left of your unit, and if you act first in combat, that's the first thing that'll happen. Um, it also means that there's sort of an incentive to design formations that target that frontmost, leftmost tile just in case. 
So it's a really dangerous spot to stick a character as well. Mm -hmm. um, but to circle back and come up with something that's kind of like the summoner, um, the Dwarven Rune Yeller is an artillery character. Um, uh, like the Dwarven Mortar, which is another artillery character, their gimmick is that they let you attack outside of combat. Uh, the Rune Yeller does this with heals, the Mortar does this with physical damage. Um, but they allow you to target from a very far distance and attack or heal everything in another unit. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was going to bring up the calculator, but that is a case of absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I don't think I really remember... The big thing about the calculator is being able to do more damage based on the total amount of time you ha you have on your save. Oh, <laughs> gosh, I never used this thing. Um, how do you even... Do you even unlock... Oh, the uh, Arithmetician. Yeah. Also known as the calculator. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't... I didn't do anything with that, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, by that point, I already had, like, Red Chocobos and, and Cloud and uh, Worker Number 9 and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But beca because, of how, because of how they're set up, they're, they are the ultimate glass cannon. <laughs> you know, being ah, able... I see. Uh, single target or multi-target? Yes. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, well, there are some there are some weird glass cannons in this system. Uh, there is a four point legendary character called Icarus, uh, whose gimmick is that he does attack all five magic damage, um, and then immediately backlashes for his full hit points. Mm -hmm. So he is sort of like a cruise missile that walks like a man. Yeah. Um, and he's also, he's a legendary character, so he has a condition that can cause him to be permanently removed from your army. And that uh, condition is if he's ever knocked out. So mm -hmm. usually, if you somehow unlock Icarus, you get to take him into battle once and then he's gone for good. Yeah. Uh, it's about as glass cannony as this system can get. Now, one of the other things that drew my attention is the fact that you are using a tarot deck for for yep. some aspects of it, both with the, yep. in particular, the divination deck. Now, is it a case where it's only the minor arcana that's being used, or is the whole ass deck being used within um, Overwar? Minor arcana and not even all of the minor arcana. Um, just the ace through six. Uh, this is done to loosely uh, give you a decent pool to draw from with, without also just saturating mm -hmm. uh, and play with various uh, divination deck effects. Yeah. Um, now, given that, is, is there a certain theme that the four suit, that each individual suit follows, even if they are doing different things? Yes. So... Uh, swords thematically is organized around damage. Um, wands is organized around buffs. Uh, cups is organized around healing. And pentacles is organized around chaos. Um, the pentacles has effects like a random character on each side suffers a 7 magic damage attack, which will knock out just about anything. Mm -hmm. um, so you can... You can specifically build around that and make a, a unit full of uh, low hit point uh, individual characters and just trust that the odds are very low that the Five of Pentacles will hit your commander. Mm -hmm. um, there's also pentacle effects that uh, swap units uh, rows. There's pentacle effects that... Um, uh, randomly recruit an enemy character to your side for the battle, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Pentacles is very wild card. Mm -hmm. Now, as I as I understand it, this is made just as much for people who want to do solo as 
as much as GMless and um, co-op and co-op in the standard sense. Yes, so, yes, that was one of the things that Alex was interested in, uh, specifically for Monarch Edition, was providing more GM support mm-hmm. and specifically enabling solo play. Which, um, so given just... his recent project, I can see why. <laughs> yep. Yeah, this is definitely in his wheelhouse. Um, so there's there's a lot of tables that you can roll on to sort of replace the GM. Uh, there's roll tables for like targeting and generating target numbers and answering simple questions and uh, generating ideas or themes or um, plot elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's also a uh, unit generator you can use to just compile enemy units. Um, and it in general, uh, a good chunk of the book goes specifically to uh, GM support and solo player support. Hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, there there was one mechanic back in Tactics that I always that I always found a bit unfortunate. Uh, and that was okay. how that was the whole brave and faith thing, and how oh, yep. balancing that could. Re- could determine whether or not somebody even stays in your party. Cause... Yeah, I honestly, as a designer, I kind of love those. I don't think they were implemented well in tactics, in that they're like they're a little baroque. They're not explained very well. Um, it's cool when they come up because it it fits the overall story being told, but uh, mechanically, they're not mm-hmm. they're not doing much. That's <laughs> yeah, that's so... good. I am. I'm. Oh. Cu- I'm curious if it's if um if an if an equivalent of that or or um some sort of parameter that that has more standard um, characters in a unit leave your company is a th- is a thing. So yes, kind of. Um, there is a repute system, which measures um how much the regular human population of Balark likes you. And I'm phrasing it that way because the regular human population of Balark is not necessarily always in the right. And they don't always make good decisions or smart decisions. And what they value is not always what's good for you or for Balark or for the people around them. Um, however, uh, if, if you take actions that the, the human public like, uh, that will raise your repute. And there are certain characters that are only usable with high repute. Uh, Similarly, if you take actions that the common people hate, that will lower your repute. And there are certain characters that are only recruitable with low repute. Um, So in that sense, kind of, there there is a mechanic that can limit uh, which characters you're able to bring in your army. But one of these days, I will make a full adaptation of Final Fantasy Tactics to tabletop, and then I'll... I'll get a chance to properly do some sort of bravery and faith mechanic. Yeah. Well, you are you would be in good company with that because there have been a few people who've di- who dipped into that over the years. Oh, interesting. Um, I can't think of any. Can't think of any systems that do Final Fantasy Tactics specifically, but uh, I'd, I'd be interested in yeah. hearing more about this. You obviously you'd ha- obviously you'd have to. You'd have to lean into the more fa- the more fan game end of things, but there's been a long history of Final Fantasy themed um, fan TTRPGs go- yep. going back a going back um, all the way back to the night all the way back to the nineties. Yes, I do know about um, some of the the Final Fantasy tabletops from like the early two thousands. I don't remember any that did tactics specifically, but. There was um, one. There was one project. There was one project that did. It did kind of straddle the line between role playing game and skirmish war game, which is oh underst- neat, understandable. Yeah, uh, it's that sort of the same space as Overwar. Uh, mm-hmm. If that is still around and you remember the title, I'd be curious to check it out. Um. 
I know I have the doc. I know I have the document for it in my ar in my archives. It's just I have a lot of I have a lot of games in my library, so I need to. Yeah, no worries. If if it's Act buried, it's buried. I can look for it. Nope, as well. ne never mind. I found it. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, now I don't know if it's hosted on any site anymore, and the. And the place where we where this was initially had is long gone, but there was a project called Evilise Alliance. Oh. Uh, oh, I think I have heard of that one. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Evilise Alliance Dude, was me. used as the name when they when they wanted to do that expanded version of uh, of the Evilise setting, which is where we get things yep. like. Um, tactics, adv tactics, advance, and um, War of the Lions, and Final Fantasy Twelve. Yep. Uh, as as well as um, Revenant Wings. Uh, yep. But given now, given all of that, given all of that, um, with the full with the full book, do you plan on having multiple? Um, multiple scenarios that's that could be could be set up to be short campaigns. Uh, yes. So there are um, bundled into the Monarch Edition. Mm -hmm. uh, there are four scenarios, um, and all of them have a. They take sort of a decent chunk of playtime. Mm -hmm. um, you can string them together into one campaign. Um, this is a game where I do want people to sort of take the content in their own direction and design their own material, but I also want to provide as much support as I can for groups that are sort of getting started with the game. Yeah, I, I can um, see that since you have a whole section on making new characters. Yeah. Yeah, I... As much as I can, whenever I can, I try to enable homebrewing. Um... So the book also has a fully detailed and statted out subsystem for designing new characters um, to make that as easy as possible uh, and to give people sort of a mechanical foundation if they do want to get into homebrewing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that certainly makes sense. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as the page count of the, of the full book? Uh, so, let me pull open the pre-art prototype. Um, everything is currently uh, all written, all in layout, I guess, pending any changes that could crop up. Um, and it is currently at 98 pages total. Mm -hmm. um, this is with a very clean, very organized layout and with a really good density of artwork. A lot of custom art that's going into this. Mm -hmm. And what what would you be shooting for as far as a release window of it? Oh, heck. Uh, that is a question for Alex and not for me. <laughs> um, my anticipation is probably uh, release ASAP. Um but I think it's ultimately going to depend on the amount of time that it takes to uh, finish commissioning and implementing all of the art. So I, because I'm not managing that part of the project, I can't really estimate it. Hmm. Uh, I can say that we have the, the writing and the design and the testing and, and all of that stuff. Um, that stuff is done. That stuff is extremely settled. We can add some more elements, but they'll be elements that are being added to an already stable environment. Mm -hmm. um, so it should be quicker than, I think, a more traditional Kickstarter where you raise the money first and then you write the game. Uh, this game is written. Uh, so it's it's going to be released at sort of the speed of the art, I think. Yeah, I can, I can get that. Um, and I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, and, this was fun. Yep. 
Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>